What do you usually do? Talk with me this morning. When a door is open to you, what do you usually do? Enter. You enter in through it. Some people do some other responses. Not only may they go through it, uh, they may close it. Uh, especially in the winter time, you know, the kids might run out the door if you have young kids and they leave the door open so you go over and shut it. That's pretty good. But there needs to be a response when there's an open door, regardless of what it is. And of course, some not only come in it, but some of them go out of it. And the way we respond to that open door does affect not only our lives, but it affects others. So when you're thinking about open doors, you need to ask yourself the question, how will this affect my life? But also, how will it affect other people's lives? I'd like for you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation this morning, chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, we just finished one of the greatest celebrations as far as I'm concerned. And that is uh, the fact of Easter that we think of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But that event had more of an effect than just the fact of provi providing salvation for you and me. It did some other things. It opened up the door for many things for you and I to have in our lives. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And I'll go more in de detail about the first thing as well. But look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. And I want you to read with me when you get there. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. Let's read together. After this I looked. And behold a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was that were of a trumpet talking with me. Which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Here, of course, we're having John see an event that was taking place and a door was open. And John responded to that open door. Uh, years ago, there was a program on, uh, uh, on TV called Get Smart. How many of you remember it? Remember Maxwell on there? Uh, Maxwell Smart? Uh, when we think about open doors, uh, he would go up to a door and it would open up, you know. Now, that's nothing new for us today because we go to shopping centers and we have the automatic doors that open up. We go to hospitals and the automatic doors open up and so forth and so on. When they open, we usually go through. But I want to ask you a question today. When God opens a door for you, how do you respond? Do you go through or do you shut it? Do you close it off to your life? I want you to take your Bible. We'll come back to Revelation 4, but turn over to the book of Hebrews. Just a uh, left turn out of your Bible. Go over to Hebrews chapter 1. When Jesus took, died upon the cross, was buried, and rose again, he opened some doors. And those doors are so vital that we respond to them in a proper way. Because it can mean the difference between life and death. It can mean the difference between happiness and sadness. And we could go on down the line mentioning things in a comparison what would happen if we do not respond to that open door. Would you look at Hebrews chapter 1 and look down at verse number 3. And I want you to pay close attention to what this has to say because it talks about an open door. Who being in the brightness of his glory. Now speaking of course Christ uh, and God the Father. And the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. That's Christ's death upon the cross, of course. Buried and rose again. That latter part verse, of that verse is so important because, because at that particular point it opened up a door that's so important for your life and my life. And that's this. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
You say, why is that important? Because through that single act, Jesus finished everything that needed to be accomplished to open up all kinds of doors for your life and my life. And I want us to look at this fact of the doors. You see, twice in the book of Revelation, the Lord talks about an open door. The first one was found right here. It actually gives reference to what we call the rapture. There are two events that are very vital for a Christian to get into the mind in regards to what is going to take place. When it's going to take place, that is another factor that only God knows. But the first one has to do with the fact of what we call the rapture, when all those who have been born again, those that know Christ as Savior, will be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. The second one has to do when Jesus comes back. When he returns at the revelation. Now, according to theologians, in my personal opinion, the rapture, of course, takes place as the next event, I believe, that will transpire as far as God's plan and purpose. We'll be called up to be with the Lord. Second event is the revelation when he comes back with the saints during the battle of Armageddon. It happens after what we call the seven years tribulation period. But regardless of that time factor, he's coming back again. And he has an open door for you and me to respond to. The Bible has a lot to say about open doors. Let me give you a few verses this morning. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 7, verses 7 through 8, it talks about the open door of prayer. That was made possible, and we'll talk more about it and give you scripture in just a few minutes, when the fact that he gave us the opportunity to come boldly before the throne of grace, as found in the book of Hebrews. The Bible says there in Matthew chapter 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Jesus gave the scripture to John there in John chapter 10 verse 7 where it says this Truly, truly, or verily, verily I say unto you listen, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus has the entrance permission. You and I have the door if we will come in. Listen, 2 Corinthians 2.12 now when I came to Torres for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord. Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Here's the key, folks. The Lord Jesus opens the way, and we need to be alert when the door is open. Because there's many open doors, but those doors can shut just like that. We have the open door to come to church today. But do you realize, it may be next Sunday, you may never be able to get, go to church again. Something might happen to your life that will transform, uh, transform your life that you'll never be able to get out of your house again. Or you'll never be able to leave. Or it could be that this door or this church would be closed because of the situations that government might close our doors or some situation that might transpire that would close these doors. We could be hit by an airplane uh, that could come down on this building and the doors would be closed. We wouldn't be able to have it until we uh, would rebuild. The Bible talks much about the fact of those open and closed doors, but only Jesus can open or close them. Now, what you and I must do is to take, as time permits, and to go through the doors that God opens before they go get closed. I was thinking about this as I was studying this past week. I'm thinking about this matter of what Jesus accomplished when he died upon the cross, he was buried, and he rose again to open the doors for your life and my life. You see, it could be, for example, that um, you're looking for a new job, and that door opens 
or maybe one time and you never have that opportunity again. And so you must evaluate how that door being open for you is going to affect your life or affect your family's life. So every open door means that you and I must be careful how we respond to that door. Well, listen this morning. First of all, Christ opened the door so we could see what God was like. Christ opened the door so we could see what God was like. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to the book of John chapter 14 with me this morning. Let's look and see what God is like. John chapter 14, look down to verse number 7, if you would, please. He opened the door that we could understand more about God and really who he was all about. Look at verse number 7, if you would, please. It says, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Now, what can we know about the Father as he opened up the door for us to understand? Well, he sent his Son, Jesus, into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Be saved. All right, so the Father says, look, if you want to see me, look at my Son in his compassion, his love for you, that you enter into the door that I open to you in regards to heaven. You see, he says here in verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. In other words, we'll be at peace. We'll be satisfied with the situation. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and, I, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So, how can we know the Father? Would Jesus open that door for us to know the Father? We can see the compassion and the love of God through Jesus Christ. When he expressed it there upon the cross. After all, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Aren't you glad for God's forgiveness today? Yes. You see, you see that through his son, Jesus Christ. He opened the door so we could see the fullness of forgiveness for our lives. Let's look at it a little bit more. One day, a woman was thrown down in front of Jesus. And they said, Jesus, she's done all these different things. She has committed this. Of course, Jesus was so wise and saw their hearts. By the way, he can see our hearts. He knows what's going on. And he bowed down and began to write in the sand. And they stood, uh, looked up. And he said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. He bent over and wrote in the sand again. When he looked up, nobody was there. And he said to the lady, where are thine accusers? He said, none, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He opened the door for forgiveness for no condemnation there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus I want to ask you a question are you in Christ Jesus today God opened the door so you could but Christ opened that up when he died upon the cross for you and me and you see Christ says it's your opportunity to enter in it's your opportunity to know about the father because I've showed you the Father. I've showed you the compassion. I've showed you his concern. Listen. He said, hey, God showed his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, what did he do? Christ died for us. You see, Christ opened the door so you and I could get a little peek about God his father and about the God who wants to save you and keep you and help you in everyday life. So the first thing that Christ did when he died upon that cross as the Hebrew, the book of Hebrews tells us he said this he said let me get back here very quickly to give you the full verse once again 
Hebrews chapter number 1, verse 3, he says, look, who being in the brightness of his glory. Now watch this. Stop this just a minute. If you want to know about the glory of God, all you do is look at Jesus Christ. He says, he is the outward representation of the Father, full of grace and truth, and he re represents the very glory of God. Of God. Now listen, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. He said, All power is given unto me both in heaven and on earth. To his disciples, he says, If you want the power to do things, he said, Look, I'll give it to you. God has opened the door through me so you can have the power. You see, folks, here's a very important principle for your life and my life. You've read the verse over and over and over again in Philippians 4.13, but it's just as real today as it was the day it was penned in God's holy writ. Amen. Here it is. I can do all things through who? Christ Jesus which strengthened me because he opened up the door for us to know the power of God for our lives. The power of God to say no to that which isn't right. The power to no, say no to that which would lead us away from the right principles of God's word and God's way. There's a second thing I want to get across to you this morning. Christ opened the very door of heaven for everybody. Would you look back at John chapter 14 and look at verse number 1. John chapter 14 and look at verse 1. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in what? Also me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He opened the door to heaven. But look at verse number four. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? Now, get a grip on this this morning. Verse, four, uh, verse number six. I want you to read it out loud with me and get a hold of the truth in regards to the open door that Jesus gave. Here we go. I, Jesus saith unto him, I am the, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now you've heard that over and over and over again, but God wants that to strike home to your heart to get a hold of this principle. If you are trusting in anything except the open door that Jesus gives, folks, you're getting in the wrong direction. You're in the wrong door. Do you realize there's some doors you should never enter into? Anything that would be contrary to Scripture is going to lead you to the wrong destination. The open door that God gives is a door of life, of salvation, of peace, of joy, that passeth all understanding. So Christ opened the door to heaven for you and me. In Matthew 23, 13, Christ pronounced a judgment upon the scribes and the Pharisees, and he said this, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither su suffer ye them that enter into to go in. Uh, turn back to the book of Luke. Let me give you this very quickly. Luke chapter number 13. You see, there's some doors that you and I should never enter into. And we enter into those doors that God opens up unto you and me. Look at uh, Luke chapter 13. And look at verse number 22, would you please? Luke chapter 13, down at verse number 22. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter into the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. 
When once the master of the house has risen up and is shut to, uh, shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock in the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunken in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, read it with me. I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, ye all workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there uh, are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. Now he's simply saying in the scripture, he says, look, you can take and say, well, I go to church. You might say, well, I pray. I read my Bible and so forth and so on. Friend, those things are good, but they won't get you to heaven. This morning we're going to have a baptismal service. But you know, being baptized does not get you to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do you know that Jesus got baptized himself? Why? As our example. Let me ask you a question. Now, I'll use a little logic here. Did Jesus need to get saved? Come on, talk with me. Did Jesus need to get saved? No. Jesus was a Savior. Let me ask you another question. If we could get to heaven some other way, why did Jesus die upon the cross? Christ died for our sins, according to Scriptures. Jesus died for sin. Are you getting what I'm trying to tell you this morning? You see, we've got to be careful what we're dependent on. By the way, let me go a little bit further. We got to be careful what we depend on to get us to heaven. Or some people say, to keep you saved. Jesus said, those I save, I lose none. Amen. Who you depend on to save you? Who you depend on to get you to heaven? See? Jesus opened the door for you and I to know the Father. He wants you to know the goodness of God. The goodness of God, the Bible tells us, leads us to repentance. But secondly, he says, I opened the door so you go to heaven. Uh, take your Bible and turn, turn over to the book of Matthew, would you please, very quickly. Matthew chapter number 7. I want you to look at two verses here very carefully. We've been studying the book of Matthew on Sunday night. And we've covered these, but I want to bring these two verses before you this morning. Look at Matthew chapter number uh, 7 and look down at verse number 13 very quickly. My time's getting away from me. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to what, folks? To destruction. Now, you know, a lot of folks, they want to get on the road where everybody's going. But you see, just because everybody's talking about heaven, not everybody's going there. Only those who come God's way. The straight gate. You see, narrow is the way. Now look at it. And many be there be which go in there at, but because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto what? Life. He's talking about eternal life there. And few there be that find it. Now what's the problem? Why aren't they finding the way? Because they're not seeking the right information. You see, this book will show you where you came from, why you're here, and where you can go. And you have the decision to make whether you want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell. You have that choice. And Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I was reading a verse the other day, and I've read it many, many times, but I'm not going to have you turn there, but I'm going to read it to you. It's found in the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2, verses 2, 10 through 11. It says, and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those who perish, 
because they receive not the love of the truth. Now what is the truth? The Bible says thy word is truth. Let's say it together. Thy word is truth. You see, God gives us the truth. And it goes on to say, you receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. You see, he's the only one can open up the door and he's opened up our eyes, but many people turn away from the truth. Now listen very carefully. Second Thessalonians talking about the time when you pass out from this life, if you have not received the, the truth, if you were to go into the tribulation period, we don't know exactly when that's going to take place. It's too late. Why? Because you've rejected the truth. You've rejected the righteous message that God has sent through His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, God says, wait a minute. You don't come just any time when you want to come. You come when the door is open. Amen. You may say, well, I'll, I'll get saved later. I'll get saved, you know, when I can settle down a little bit. No, the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You don't have the opportunity, maybe, another day. The strong delusion, folks, is this. He is going to, the devil is going to give you a strong delusion that you're going to not believe the truth if you reject it. And the Bible says you'll be damned for eternity. Now, does God want that? Well, there's so many verses in the Bible that shows us he doesn't. My favorite verse is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, where it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, but as, uh, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward. Now listen to this, is long suffering to usward, not willing that say it with me. Any. Are you an any? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Christ opened up that door for you and me in regards to the long-suffering of God that you would repent of your sin and trust Him before it's eternally too late. You see, Christ opened the door for forgiveness for every single person. Dr. Billy Graham received a message from someone one day and it said this, Dear Dr. Graham, I've lived a pretty rebellious life, but now I'm older and I've given anything, I'd give anything to be able to erase the past and know God has forgiven me. But I can't believe God will ever do that. He might forgive some people, but not someone who's done all the things I've done. Is there any hope for me? R.K. was signed to the paper. Dr. Graham sat down and wrote, Dear R.K., I'm thankful you finally realized that the road you've been on doesn't lead anywhere except to sorrow, guilt, emptiness, and eventually death. Centuries ago, the writer of Ecclesiastics, like you, like you pursued every pleasure imaginable, but he finally concluded with these words. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What he was telling that man was simply this. You chase after the things of the open doors of this world instead of the open door that God gives and your life will end meaningless with no hope and you'll be like you're chasing the wind. God says, I've opened a door for you and it's your responsibility to respond. Respond to the open door to know God. Respond to the door, open door, to know how to get to heaven. Respond to the door that opens up forgiveness for all that you've done in your life. I want you to turn your Bible over to the book of 1 Corinthians, would you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want you to look down at verse number 12 here that Christ opened the door for a victorious 
assurance because of his resurrection that we've just celebrated here a week ago. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look down at verse number 12, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ be priest, that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That is, if Jesus did not die and then rise again. But look at verse number 20. Christ is the open door because of his victorious resurrection that gives a promise to you and me that we will likewise rise again if we know him unto eternal life. Look at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by, came, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, now read with me, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, Christ gave us the open door of assurance that you and I can likewise be able to take and be raised from the dead again unto eternal life. Take your Bible and turn over, if you would. And my mind just went blank to the scripture I want you to have. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. I read this scripture so often in, in uh, uh, memorial services or funeral services that I have. Look down at verse number 13. Here's the problem that a lot of people have in regards to God's open door. He says, but I would not have you to be what? A lack of knowledge. Bible says my people were destroyed for a lack of knowledge. How can we get the knowledge so we can know the open doors that God has for us? It's called the Bible. Now look at the rest of the verse, verse 13. Brethren, concern them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no what? That word hope there means assurance. Assurance. Now look at verse number 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, amen? amen. If we believe that, and we believe it based upon what the Bible tells us, and folks, God does not lie. Would you say amen? amen. So what's the rest of the thing here that God says? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them, which, uh, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Read verse 17 and 18 with me. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's assurance that you and I have that God opens up through Jesus Christ to your life and my life. Here's one for you. Christ, in opening the door, as Hebrews 1.3 said, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What is that for you and me? He opened up a door that was not open, actually, in many of the people's lives of the Old Testament, and that is a mediator or an intercessor. Let me read that verse to you again in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. 
who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Why? And here's why. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ, Jesus. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And I say amen. amen. He's there making intercession for you and me. He is praying for you. Listen. If he prayed upon the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Jesus is eternal. What do you think he's still doing today? He's praying for you. He wants you to be saved. But Christian, he's also praying for you and me. He's making intercession for us. You know why? Because the old devil comes and he touches you on the shoulder and he says, see what you just did? He said, what did I just do? You thought that wrong thought. You had that wrong attitude. You treated that person wrong. You stole that thing. You cheated. You lied. You understand what I'm saying? And Jesus makes intercession to the Father and says, Father, they're mine. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the Bible says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7. You see, in him opening up the door, he opens the door for you and I to pray. How's your prayer life today? God wants us to pray. Not just when we're in trouble, but talk to him. Hey, I don't know about you. I like talking with my kids. Now you say, I don't like to talk to my kids all the time. Well, that may be true in certain cases. But most of the time we like to communicate with our kids. You know one of the greatest breakdowns in the home today is? Lack of communication. How's your communication with God? Jesus said, I made an open door for you. So what are you going to do with it? Let me give you one last thing. Would you take and turn over, if you would, please, uh, back to the Hebrews uh, chapter number 1 and verse 3. I want you to see something here very quickly before I close this morning. He says, Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his what? power. His word is power for your life in my life. You see, when we permit God's word to be in our lips and our mouths, he opens up the door for us to share the gospel with other people. He opens up the door for you and I to share comfort with other people. He opens up the door for you and I to encourage other people. So what are you doing with the words of his power for your life? God wants us to take and use them for his honor and his glory. Let me close with this this morning, though I have several other things I'd like to say, but I'll not say them this morning. There was an elderly lady who ran out of money, and a lot of us know about that. Anybody ever run out of money? Raise your hand. Yeah, we do. Especially at the end of the month where you're waiting for your checks, right? Or at the end of the week, you're waiting for your checks. Being where an elderly lady ran out of money and couldn't pay any of her bills. And of course, she lived in a rented apartment. And so the landlord was threatening to throw her out if she didn't pay her rent. She had only a few candles to keep her warm. And one cold day, she was warming her hands over a candle. And just then, a knock came to the door. But she was afraid to answer for fear that it was the landlord that was come to kick her out of her house. And she blew out her candle and sat quietly in the dark waiting for him to leave or waiting for whoever who was out there to leave. Two weeks later, she found out that the knock on the door had not come from her landlord at all. 
It had come from a friend to bring her enough money to pay her rent and all her debts. And if only she had opened up the door, she could have had that need met. I want to ask you a question today. Are you going through the open doors that God opens up to your life? In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, there's a door that God says, you must open up. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man do what? Hear my voice and, come on, say it with me. Open. And open the door. He said, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. You see, God opens up many doors. But there's one door he cannot and he will not open. And that door is the door to your life. You have to make that decision. And you have that opportunity to do that today. If you will. He's opened all the doors to know God the Father. He's opened all the doors to get to heaven. He's opened all the doors to forgiveness. He's opened all the doors to help you and I reach out to people and help them and encourage them and do things for them. But he cannot and will not open the door to your life. That is something you have to do. Now the question is, will you open it up unto him today? Secondly, will you be willing to go through the doors that God opens up for you in this life? Every day, there's open doors. It's our responsibility to check out to make sure we go through the right ones. What are you going to do about it? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Every head bowed and every eye cl closed. Now, friend, with our heads bowed and eyes are closed, doors are important to respond to, whether answering them or walking through them. Because, number one, they're going to affect your life. Now and for eternity. But also they may affect somebody else's life. Did you realize this morning that maybe if you open up your heart to the Lord and you respond to the invitation, you might affect somebody else to walk down that aisle too? What are you going to do with the open door? Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed? Father in heaven, as we stand this morning here before you, I ask you to speak to every person's heart here this morning, especially those who are not saved, that they might see there's an open door for them to trust you today. I pray they'll walk through that open door. I pray for every Christian who will walk through the open doors that you give them, the opportunities that we have in this life that you open up. And Lord, I pray that we might see sometimes they're not real wide doors. It may be a very narrow door. But that's where we're to go through as you open it up. Lord, I pray this morning you work in each one of our hearts. I'm talking about myself, dear Lord. If there's something that you want me to respond to, I pray that I'll do it. But touch each heart and each life of individuals across this auditorium and those who are watching by means of the internet. May you work in each heart. And Lord, I'll trust you for it. And I'll thank you for it. Because I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Doc, what are we singing this morning? 675. 675 in your hymn books. If you